Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Newcastle Fast FM. This is the Sisters Hour on Mondays, Thursdays and Fridays from 5 till 6. And on Mondays, we are Sisters Striving with myself, Sadiqa, and my co-host, Fazana. Assalamu alaikum, Fazana. Wa alaikum salam. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. How, how are you, Sid? How's your bank holiday? Good, alhamdulillah. <laughs> it's going well. Alhamdulillah. Um, so... The past few days, Fazana, we've been discussing mindset, haven't we, and productivity. Yeah. We've worked a lot on our inner selves, so today we're going to move on to the physical. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, we've been given the bodies that we're in while we're here in this life. The Prophet wasallam, said, Indeed, your own self has rights over you. Our bodies are an amana from Allah, meaning that he has entrusted us with them, and we have a responsibility towards them. We could be rewarded or punished depending on how we treat them. We can't overlook, undermine or belittle the importance of our bodies. Imagine on the day of judgment as well, there'll be witnesses against us. So we need to be good to them and do good with them. If looking after our bodies means that we excel in our ibadah, we can multiply our good deeds a lot. Not only are we worshipping more, but the potential for a higher quality level of worship is there too. So therefore, the act of looking after our bodies with that intention is rewarding in itself as well. And today we're going to talk about not only what we consume, but what we output with our bodies as well. So we start off talking a little bit about food, shall we, Fazana? Yeah, perfect. So yeah, so like Sid just said, um, today's show kind of feeds on quite nicely from what we've been talking about in the past about boosting ourselves mentally. And we're trying to explore that a little further and take it and look at our physical well-being. And one of those aspects of physical well-being, particularly now in Ramadan, that comes to the forefront of our minds is our food consumption. Uh, a vital part of what determines our health is what we consume. And of, as Muslims, we should look to consider how um, different aspects of our lives impacts our worship and our spirituality and um, ultimately our purpose on this earth is to worship Allah and if something we do on a regular basis can impact our worship then it's something that we should consider um, as well so in terms of food consumption it's a daily thing it, um, so it, it, can, it can have an impact on our spirituality I'm sure that a lot of us have um, and also uh, inner spirituality, but also the outward acts of uh, worship. You know, I'm sure a lot of us have had that experience where we've maybe overeaten um, and, you know, you, you end up feeling lethargic in prayer um, or, you know, or opposite times when you're fasting throughout the day, you might have la lack of energy, so unmotivated. So we know like that our diet and what we consume um, affects us inwardly. Um we've been blessed with the opportunity to be in a position where food choice is is vast and we have the freedom to make choices around what kind of foods we consume and what um what what we don't um it's it's advised islamically to ensure that we don't overindulge with food um in a hadith the prophet sallallahu said no human being has ever filled a container worse than his own stomach the son of adam needs no more than a few morsels of food to keep up his strength doing so he um, should consider that a third of his stomach is for food a third for drink and a third for breathing and i think there that's a really good reminder to us about how we can look at our diets um in moderation and think you know is my diet excessive what does my diet contain? And am I um, over prioritizing food in terms of um, over consuming it? And am I allowing space for the things like the Prophet advised leaving a third empty? I think nowadays in our society, we're very used to eating to our full and that isn't something that's Islamically advised. Listening to that hadith said, what do you take from that? I think it's a big reminder, actually, the way it starts, no human being has ever filled a container worse than his own stomach. That, that scares you to start with. And then the prophet goes on to say that we only need a few morsels of food to keep up our strength and that we should reserve a third for food, a third for drink, a third for breathing. I don't know many people who put this into practice. Mm. And it's quite, quite scary to think, actually, what we what we consider as normal today, what our portion yeah. sizes are, what we think we need when compared to what we actually need. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, 
I think definitely what you've just said there about portion control, I think that, that hadith basically reminds us of that. I think a lot of the times we have a habit of like um, eat, it's, it's quite normalized to if you're hungry, eat till you're full full like you know i'm hungry yeah. i'm gonna smash it i want to uh, you know i want to eat i want to eat and uh, and you know even like you know all these restaurants are closed everyone's really looking forward to going out there and indulging in their favorite meals which is great alhamdulillah like we should look forward to these things but that that hadith there is a really good reminder about balance i think and about you know consuming in moderation and also i think yeah. it also reminds us a lot about how you know f filling your stomach um is to its full it's like it's quite and deemed quite a negative thing and because of the connotations it can have on our worship and because it's a means of really fulfilling um our, our desires um as i was reading around this topic i came across a really um, interesting quote um, by ibrahim ibn adam that said anyone who controls his stomach is in control of his deen and anyone who controls his hunger is in control of good behavior disobedience towards allah is nearest to a person who is satiated with a full stomach and furthest away from a person who is hungry so i think that's a really interesting reminder about you know how being gluttonous and like overeating overindulging can you know deviate us um and I think it's probably linked to the fact that it's it's about fulfilling desires rather than self-control. If, yeah. if people who are listening, it would be interesting to find out like what you interpret from that um, in terms of reading that hadith and reading that quote. How do you how do you think what we eat and our ibadah? How are those two things linked? And have you personally seen an impact in, with your diet and or your eating habits and how well you can worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? Do you do you see a link there, Sid? Yeah, definitely. And I would love to hear from the listeners today as well on that, uh, about the stomach being the worst vessel to fill. And what do you guys take from it? So please comment below. Um, we really need to be conscious of greed and waste as well. I think it's just a case of take what we need and that's it. And as Muslims, we know that we shouldn't be wasting anything either, whether it's our time, our health, our wealth, food, water, it's discouraged to waste anything really and in the Quran Allah said he is the one who has created gardens trellised and untrellised and date palms and crops with a variety of edibles and the olive and the pomegranate some similar to one another and some dissimilar eat of its fruit when it bears fruits and pay its due on the day of harvest and do not be extravagant surely Allah does not like the extravagant or wasteful people so it's quite clear here, we're told to enjoy all these favours that Allah has given us, but not to go over the top, because mm. Allah doesn't like us being wasteful. And I think this is so relevant to us in this day and age. And we're just living a lifestyle where we have everything at our fingertips, but we're also becoming more aware that our Earth's resources are being used and abused as well. The production of food the damage to the environment that Allah has created for us, we are responsible for wasting and polluting. And funnily enough, that pollution is coming back to us through our food and damaging us further. The mm. plastic waste from like our food packets and things, you know, the little fishies are eating them and then we'll eat the fish and then they're getting back into us. Mm. So we've got to be really careful because we're damaging ourselves in more ways than one. And yeah. Every, everything that we do is leaving behind a footprint, a trail of evidence. And over our lifetimes, I dread to think how much waste one individual person is accumulating. And we need to consider what we can do to reduce it. Because I think we are very guilty of just going with the flow and living this normal, convenient way of life. And the level of consumption that's considered normal in this country, we're letting, you know, society dictate our personal lifestyles when we should be... Mm look into the Quran and the Sunnah for that. What do you reckon? Yeah, absolutely. I think you've made a really good point there about how um, our food choices also impact our environment. Um, as Muslims, we're encouraged to take care of our environment, take care of the earth, um, do what we can to have a positive impact on the earth. And 100% now, because we're at a point in society where, like you said, everything's just available, 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 that it has actually driven the earth to you know almost breaking point the scientists would say right and um, even like the simple things like food that's not in season like fruit and veg that's not in season in the uk is pretty much always available and that says something about like the air miles that food does to get to us the preservatives that are there to keep it keep it right those kind of things are really important to consider 
I think one thing as well that massively impacts our environment is um, the meat uh, con- meat consumption and um, uh, consumption of fish. I, I'm, I'm not an expert to talk on the topic, but it's definitely one of those things that it would have a massive impact on the environment if we had reduced our meat consumption because of um, the environmental impact of agriculture, you know, rearing crops. Uh, I remember reading somewhere that um, one of the main deforestation causes is to clear land for cattle. Um, And and then the water that goes into that, it's it's kind of an endless spiral of um, impact on the environment that cattle rearing does. And even like the fishing industry, you mentioned plastics um, that are end up in fish. Uh, a lot of the the ret- rhetoric that's around now is that the the onus is on the individual to choose to like not dump plastic in the rivers and the seas and things. And yes, that is something that that we should consider about how we're damaging the environment in, um, by you know wasting plastic waste and things. But the vast majority of plastic waste that ends up in the seas comes from the fishing industry. You know, fishing nets, leftover equipment, this, that, and the other. Um, I watched a really in, interesting documentary on that recently that if anyone hasn't watched, it's called Sea Spiracy. You might have seen it. But it really goes into the details of how damaging the fishing industry is on the environment. And what's interesting is that, you know, in the Prophet um, Sadai Islam's time, um, p- people of the past would eat uh, primarily um, non-meat-based diet. Like uh, meat, was, meat did exist, of course, that people did eat meat as part of their diet. But it was mainly a diet that was full of whole foods, um, you know, foods that were from the earth, naturally grown there, not, um, you know, not foods that was not accessible to them in, in a natural circumstance. And um, a, and a minimum minimum form of meat, like majority veggie, veggie diets. Um, and now all the science is telling us that, you know, overconsumption of meat has negative health benefits and, ma- um, sorry, negative health effects and massive, massive impact on the environment. So definitely think that, considering your environmental impact of your food choices is really really important and also I think for people who are listening out there if if that's not something you've thought about before you know how does my food choices affect the environment I would say start small think about maybe something a small part of your diet and think about you know actually where does that food come from um I ca- is there a small tweak I can make in my diet alhamdulillah you know our faith is it allows things to be easy for us it's about moderation about balance it's not about going to an extreme and thinking right i'm never going to eat meat again that's definitely not what this sister show is about <laughs> eat your chicken wings but just um you know think about how that's imp- impacting the environment that thought you know planting that seed in your head and having to think about it is is definitely one food for thought i think if anybody else who's listening wants to share anything that they know about environment to impact of food choices i think that'll be really useful for us to know um i think as well like um the prophet um in terms of um advice around eating food um the prophet said so i'm gave us a lot of advice around um etiquettes of eating food but also how we can manage our diets one of the um prophetic advices is not to eat in haste you know the prophet said so i'm used to um you know, frown upon like pe- people rushing their food and like, uh, you know, blowing on their food to cool it down and things like that. Um, and what, uh, and now we're told, you know, eat slowly, chew, you know, there's, I'm sure there's like a certain number of times you're supposed to chew your food before you swallow it and whatnot. And it's all about, you know, slowing yourself down and actually allowing yourself to feel that, you know, it stops you from overindulging. Sid, have you heard that, you know, you're supposed to chew your food as a dentist, like, you know, a certain amount of time. <laughs> I have actually heard that. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm aware that if you don't chew your food properly, if you eat too quickly, your your system can't tolerate it as well. It can cause digestive problems as well. You can't get all the nutrients out of your food. You need yeah. to you need to take your time eating and chewing because yep. your digestion starts in your mouth. And you need the food in little pieces. So as it's going through your body at each stage, you can draw out all the goodness from it. So I definitely agree with that. And I've heard that before for a long time that you need to chew so that another thing is so that your um, brain can tell your body when it's getting full as well. Rather than you eat so quickly, you haven't had time to realize what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Like rushing down your food and then not even knowing like how much you've eaten or like, you know, whether you're even full. I think that slowing down process is super important for food. Um, But um, also um, uh, there's a little um, narration I came across uh, where the Prophet said his son was talking to the companions and um, the companions told the Prophet, we eat, but we are not uh, um, satisfied. 
and he, peace be upon him, said, perhaps you eat separately. The companions replied in affirmative. Then he said, um, eat together and mention the name of Allah over your food. It will be blessed for you. So, and you know, what we can understand from um, that hadith, and I think obviously, if, if, please share if, uh, what, what others understand from it. But the idea of being filled can come more from just physically filling your bellies. I think eating in good company, what's, uh, what's beautiful about that little narration there is eating in, in good company can also help us feel satisfied. You know, when we eat alone, we you could have a tendency to fall into bad habits. I don't think people are likely to binge or overeat when they're in, in good company. And it builds good habits, I think, of, of sharing, of, you know, being mindful of what you're eating, uh, whether others have enough. And also it brings together, you know, bonds of kinship that's really important uh, for our well-being and our faith to be close to those that are around us. I think food has a way of bringing people together. So eating in good company is another good practice that we can bring into our lives so that we can be more mindful of what we're eating when we're in the company of others. That's um, such an excellent point. Can I um, just go to the comments as well? We've had a few yep. responses to our question asking, how is Ibadah and eating linked? So we've mm -hmm. had lots of People commenting their salams. So, walaikum as salam to all of well, you. Which is like a and um, let's have a look. So, we had a comment from Amna ZK mm -hmm. saying, I think ibadah and eating is linked by moderation. We shouldn't mm -hmm. be overeating nor pushing ourselves too far in our ibadah as the drop would be bigger. It's about small, consistent steps. Mm, yeah. I think, I think that's that key. Yeah, I think what the sister said there about consistency ties into everything we were talking about last time. If you've got a good intention to do something and you have you're consistent with it, I think that's really really important. So being mindful of what we eat in in a consistent manner rather than the extremes, you know, extreme ibadah or extreme um, diet control. Definitely mm. small and consistent steps. And then she went on to say, like at iftar, we should eat smaller portions, but consistently. I think. Mm. Yeah. So again, being consistent in those acts, but also not overeating so that you can't go on to do other things as well. So that you're, like you mentioned earlier, like sluggish and just too full <laughs> to do anything afterwards. Mm. And she also commented the same goes with eating meat as well in moderation. I think that's a common theme, isn't it? Um, yeah. Mod everything in moderation. I think that's the best way to get to gain the benefits and not overdo it um, yeah. in many different yeah. aspects. Definitely, definitely. With, and then um, we had uh, a comment from Badria A saying, this is so true. So I think agreeing with Amina's comments mm. and say, saying, good company, enjoying food together. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, um, good company makes all the difference. It makes the food more enjoyable, doesn't it? Definitely. And it's like what you said, that feeling of you're eating, but you still feel empty. Maybe it's because you're eating alone. You need you know, that good company around you to enjoy your food. So yeah. that's a nice little point. We had another comment from Rasha Taisir saying, one of the reasons we can't control the portions of food is that 90% of the products on the shelf in markets contain sugar to keep on addicting on them. That's an interesting mm. point. What do you reckon? Yeah. That is a really interesting point. And that just highlights as well how unaware we are when we grab things off the shelves. Like, um, you know, are we thinking about additives? Are we thinking about how this food's going to impact uh, on our like kind of behavior around food? Like the sister said, it kind of keeps us keeps us grabbing for more. So yeah, I think that's definitely a good point to remind everyone to be mindful of what are you picking off off the shelves, and like yeah, as well, like so far, sorry. Go on. No, I was just going to say you can't transform a shopping trip overnight, but at least you can now think about, okay, well, is this really a good choice in terms of uh, as, as a regular part of my diet or not? And I was just going to say I like the comment because it's made me think of things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. She's saying that it's the products on the shelves in the market. Okay, what are they trying to do? They're trying to sell them. So obviously yep. they want to they make them tasty and addictive, so we keep buying them. Yeah. So that's another perspective to look at things from. Yeah, um, we're we're kind of we're almost you know without thinking, just following mm -hmm. into the following into what the shops are trying to do, trying to sell us. Yeah, 
I think also it's a good reminder as well about um, trying to lean towards the prophetic diet of whole foods um, more than like processed foods. Because with whole foods, you know exactly what's going into your meals. If you decide to buy individual ingredients and make a dish, you know what's going in there, exactly what's going in there, rather than buying yeah. foods that's processed. Obviously, that's not something that's achievable every single day in every single meal, but it's something that we can try and get into more of our diets than, you know, a more majority of our diet. Yeah, and following that, Fatima Adam commented, grow your own food if you can. So yeah. I think we're, we're in agreement there. I think there's a lot of benefits, actually, to growing your mm -hmm. own food. Like you say, you know exactly what's going into it, but it's a skill in itself, isn't it? It's it's so rewarding to be able to achieve making your <laughs> making your own food from scratch, from the garden. Yeah, and definitely. We don't do enough of it, do we, today? <laughs> No, I always feel I always feel like when I see people who have like proper green fingers, I really admire them. I'm like, oh, you know, I wish I had my own little greenhouse. But you know, this yeah. is something that you, you could everyone can have a go at, I guess. So yeah. Yeah. So before we move on to talk about um physical activity, I want to ask another question to our listeners, which is what benefits have you gotten from an activity apart from the physical? So you might have set out to engage in a sport or some kind of health program but apart from the physical effects on your body what other ways have you benefited I'd be interested to hear that so okay. let's go into fitness then the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said a strong believer is better and dearer to Allah than a weak one and both are good adhere to that which is beneficial for you so being physically stronger, more active, more energetic will help us in our daily worship, amongst other things. So how can we be strong believers? We need to get active. We need it for our daily worship, yes, um, but there's many other aspects to it. Think about the biggest trip of your life, Hajj. How are you going to fulfill that pillar of Islam if we're not fit? The Prophet encouraged us to be strong and to be healthy, and he was active himself. Where was he when the first revelation came? Can you remember Fazana? Uh, he was in the cave. Exactly. He was in the cave of Hira, which was in Jabal and Nur, the mountain of light. There's only one way up that mountain. Exactly. So, Physical activity. Exactly. So it just shows what kind of person he was going there um, every now and then to uh, get his uh, alone time. So if we go to Mecca or Medina, um, you know, outside of the Hajj and Umrah rituals, which you will need to be active for, there's mm. sites to see as well. There's mountains to walk up. There's, you know, different spots to visit, just as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. So I think, um, and I think that's a big part of like the trip as well. If you know, you just get to go, um, is to be able to see everything. Um, be yeah. like, oh, this is where this is where this battle took place. Oh, this is where you know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to live. You know, things like that. It just helps bring things together and help you appreciate what was going on at the time and um you know go, being able to go on those field trips and being able to walk those distances i think is really important because otherwise how are you going to see those things mm. there's certain sports as well that are encouraged in the sunnah the prophet peace be upon him said teach your children swimming yeah. archery and horse riding um he said any action without the remembrance of allah is either a diversion or heedlessness except for four acts and amongst those four acts he mentioned walking from target to target during archery practice training a horse and learning to swim what do yeah. you think of that Fasana? well i think you know what those activities first of all it's like a reminder that you know it's good to have hobbies that bring you benefits um in, in terms of your physical uh, well-being um these activities are super super enjoyable as well um do you remember when we went horse riding sid oh yes I remember it very clearly <laughs> yeah that was a really really fun weekend and you know what it brings people together it's a new skill it, to be honest it's something I would love to have pursued uh, for a longer period of time but yeah I can definitely see why you know the um sports is encouraged because of the enjoyment you get out of uh, the mental health benefits you get out of it and obviously keeping your body physically moving um, yeah so you yeah definitely you get the benefits physically like you said your body's physically moving but there's so much to it it's so much fun as well right yeah no 100 percent. It, it is a lot of fun and also it's it's one of those things that combats um the kind of normal state i think in current society which is to be very 
sedatory if that's the right word like office work working from home we're all kind of used to being quite still you know we, mm. and mobility is so easy now as well like you know zoom around in your cars it's just it's too convenient for us to like opt for the non-moving option whereas in this hadith the prophet is reminding us that you know what teach your children swimming archery and horse riding put your kids out there to get involved in things that demand physical movement from them um you know the prophet himself used to engage in these activities um and it's a real reminder to us that we should prioritize physical movement in our day-to-day -day lives yeah and these are activities that could seriously come in useful one day you you may be in a situation where you need to swim to survive mm. you know and you know in in those times as well like you had to rely on the horse you didn't have a car to zip around with so you know they're practical activities as well actually and yeah. another activity that the prophet peace be upon him himself took part in was wrestling mm. um so it just goes to show like there's, there's more evidence that he was an active person himself so he is the best example and we need to take from that um so obviously there's the physical benefit to being active but well what else do we gain well i was thinking it keeps your mind active as well mm -hmm. being being involved in some some kind of hobby physically you have to be able to manage your time as well a lot of activities involve teamwork as well leading leadership skills yeah. you've got to work on strategy concentration patience hand-eye coordination um but also you get those happy hormones don't you whenever you do physical activity and then that yeah. in turn can lower your stress and anxiety levels and you get that feeling of accomplishment that feeling of self self-worth as well mm -hmm. from, yeah. from making those achievements um what kind of benefits do you take from physical activity for Zona? uh i think all of the things that you just mentioned that i think um creating a routine around physical activity always really helps and admittedly i've not been um, on it through through ramadan like i would have wanted to but i think having physical activity as part of your daily routine adds structure gives you something to look forward to and you know what uh, and i think one one thing that you just said there said about the happy hormones i feel like that's for me that's what gets me to do physical activity because beforehand and I don't know if anyone else falls into this trap and so if you do please share in the comments but say if you know you've got a workout in mind and you know right today at this time I'm going to work out unless I do it straight away I kind of build up this dread in my mind about it that puts me off it but what yeah. helps me actually do it and get over that like you know procrastinating is reminding myself that you know what remind yourself about how you feel at the end of that workout or whatever it is the end of that power walk or whatever you do to boost your fitness those happy yeah. hormones actually like properly manifest and you feel so good about it so i feel like in thinking about that before you begin your workout um as a motivation really really helps you, I'd, I'd be interested to know as well you know from from the listeners uh, um you know what is it that we if have you got any tips or tricks that where we can use them to boost our day-to-day -day movement day-to-day -day physical activity because we obviously yeah. we've, just mentioned, we've just mentioned workouts and you know and i think a lot of people have maybe they go to the gym they have that specific routine but but there is like kind of without going to the gym and without having you know a specific workout schedule there's definitely ways that we can just get a movement increased and i feel like you know in our communities as well um that is particularly important is and talking about maybe the elder generation in particular trying to find ways that you know movement is encouraged that's not just you know right you need a gym membership to get and get yourself to the gym you know are there easy fixes what can we do to just make sure that movements are more of a priority in our day yeah what do you think to that, that listeners yeah that's a really good question so to the listeners how can we incorporate more physical activity within our day-to-day -day routines i like yeah. that one for Zana. and they have been commenting actually on our earlier questions so i'll just um have a look at them yeah Russia Taisir said, Ibada and eating doesn't mix. If I eat, I can't pray or concentrate in reading Quran. The best solution is breaking iftar with some dates and water and then eat after three hours. That's an interesting one, Russia. Um, it might work for some, it might not for others, but um, if that's if that's how you concentrate, manage to concentrate, as long as you're making sure you're getting your nutrients in there, then mm. do what works for you, sister. Um, so on the question about um, benefits from sports, we had we had a comment from Niyama, Gnama spelt Niyama, saying, a benefit I got from kickboxing two years ago was to get rid of a lot of stress and my depression. That's an interesting one. Um, I, 
I've been, I'm sure like there's a lot of other things that goes into it about um, helping manage your depression, but it's interesting that you found a benefit was kickboxing. Mm. So thank you for commenting that. Um, and then they also commented horse riding is amazing. It's a, it is an amazing feeling, isn't it? What what do you think, Faz? Like to those who have never tried it, what would you say? Um, it makes you feel like you're you're in a movie. <laughs> like that's the only way I can really describe it. To be honest, like I really like. First of all, horses are really majestic creatures. They just you just look yeah. at you just look at them and you just think oh, that's it's it you know. Out of all the farm animals, I guess, it puts you in the most awe, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they're just so pretty. They're beautiful to look at. I think as well, like, horse riders and their horses have this, like, really cool bond that you see, don't you? That, you know, even when we were at the stables, we could see, like, the guy who's running the stables. He, You know, there was clearly a good management of the horses and things. I think those all things come into it. But also, it's just, like, yeah. a physically, it, it does put a physical strain on your body. It makes your body work hard. Um, I'm talking like I'm an experienced rider, by the way. I've I've ridden a horse twice, <laughs> but <laughs> but what I'm saying is it was really really enjoyable. And I think actually, you know what? A lot of us might not have the capability, you know, the time or even like the finances to to finance a a, um, a hobby like that. You know, regular horse riding but that doesn't mean no we can't go out there and have a go once in a while you know if you're if you're away on a weekend with your friends why not try and put that in an, as an activity you know alhamdulillah it's following the sunnah it's having to go at a sunnah sport and it's also getting ourselves mobile i would definitely exactly. recommend it we just did it as a group of friends didn't we sid I had a go at it and i think everybody really enjoyed it and for a lot of people there i think the vast majority were new to riding hadn't be, really been on a horse before um and it was just something new to try and it was fulfilling a sunnah at the same time, alhamdulillah. Exactly. And the listener went on to comment, it feels so, so good to do exercise, do physical activities and amazing for the immune system as well. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, and then um, we've also had, let's have a look, we've also had a comment saying, any sports taking the stress out of our bodies and give us health is great. Working out makes me happy. And that's from yeah, mm -hmm. Russia, Tarsir again. Yeah. yeah, I think it, it does make a lot of people happy at the end of it. There is a, a real sense of accomplishment there, definitely. Um, on the question about how do we incorporate more physical activity into our daily routines, mm -hmm. Nama commented again saying, walk every day, drink plenty of water, do not say sitting down all day in front of a screen for hours. I think that's a very easy one to do, sit in front of a screen for hours. Yeah. Um, that's a really good comment. And then um, they went on to say, I gained lots of extra weight during the first lockdown last year, sitting in front of my room for business mm -hmm. Zoom meetings. It was so upsetting. So I started exercising more. Good on you for realizing that and for, for being, you know, for taking action. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people have probably fell into that over the past year, having yeah. to, you know, work from home, sitting on their meetings and things. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that's really good that you've taken action. Um, yeah. I definitely think as well, like um, like you said, Sid, in, in lockdown, I think a lot of people have um, kind of slipped into that because working from home is kind of gets quite comfortable. So the movement kind of declines. But on the other hand, lockdown also forced us to kind of, because we were like limited with what we could do, we still are. It kind of forced everyone to explore more outdoor spaces, go on these like walks. People were being more creative about, you know, where you could get to, what you could do, you know. And I think that actually you know I don't know about you but I feel like people that I've been around have been more um motivated to like you know get the steps in or like you know go and go somewhere new to enjoy the scene scenery and you know go for a walk I think that's really important and mm, it, yeah. if, hopefully we can leave like the lockdown and leave the pandemic behind but take those good habits with us where you know we can actually enjoy nature and also you know it, improve our physical health while we do it Yep, and Mukit Khan said, body, mind, and soul. Mo many Muslims unfortunately assume these three are not interrelated and connected, that one or more can affect the rest either positively or negatively. So, yeah, definitely. We're looking at the overall benefits on our bodies, you know, and our minds and our souls. So, uh, that's definitely a good point. Um, at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they lived in a really harsh environment. You know, when we're talking about our Zoom meetings and things like that at the minute, it just makes me think back. They had to be strong physically. They had to travel. They had to fight. Their, their daily tasks alone need physical strength. 
we're not in that environment now so we definitely need to make a conscious effort to take on physical activity and mm. there are lots of options for us you know it can be as simple as walking more instead of driving it could mm -hmm. be join, joining a group joining a class joining a gym for us sisters there are a lot of options um you know women only sessions and trainers and things private spaces we can hire um where we can still maintain our hijab and our modesty um interesting how when the listener earlier commented about sitting in front of a screen because I was reading up that sitting for too long can increase your risk of death as well which is quite quite alarming considering a lot of us spend our jobs spend our days sitting down whether it's watching tv mm -hmm. you know sitting on the car sitting in the car sitting on the bus um so the way to overcome this is to break up prolonged periods of sitting um mm. and like you mentioned earlier, Fazana, we've got to avoid that sedent sedentary lifestyle because that's not what us humans are built for. We've got to be getting up and moving because um, it affects our well-being massively. Yeah, 100%. And um, I think there was a, a comment earlier. I don't know if you can see it, Sid, by Mariam. Oh, I can't see the comment. Oh, uh, which comment? There we go. Oh, I can see it now. Mental health uh, do be important, though, as well as physical health. Yeah, so um, the sisters just pointed out there that mental health is really important as well as physical health. And yeah, over the last couple of shows, we've been talking about how we can maximize ourselves within our minds and think about, you know, aspects of building a strong and resilient mindset. Definitely. And then this show, we've kind of moved on to talk about how um, how we can you know, manifest those positive things in our physical health as well. I think the earlier mm. comment as well um, said, you know, mind, body, and soul, they are all entwined. There isn't, there isn't really a separation of the, of those things. Um, if we healthy mind can, you know, help us prosper in terms of our physical health and vice versa, you know, we've just, a lot of what we've just talked about there has been about how actually being physically active is so much better for your mind I think you, I think everyone can have a go at this activity you know, think about a day where you did very little with your time you sat you kind of like slouched for a lot of the day and um, you know didn't really get out on about compared to a day where you felt like you'd exerted yourself physically you know you'd 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 gotten that exercise in in terms of mental well-being I think there's a massive difference there and not even just that like at the end of the day uh, um, you know listeners if you agree like you sleep better as well would you would you say say like once you've had a good and active day your your, your yeah. quality of sleep improves and that comes un into health as well health is like health is a vast thing you know health is subjective what does good health mean to to you that's a question definitely for, for the view uh, for the listeners what does good health mean is it just you know being you know physically fit is it about having a sound mind and feeling good within your mind uh, you know, is it about you know little things in our daily routine about uh, am i getting the right amount of sleep am i getting the right amount of um you know nutrients and diet in in my diet but really what we know is health is comprises of all these things and it's very holistic and it's very individual you have to think about what your individual needs are but ultimately we all know that healthy bodies means healthy minds and healthy minds motivates healthy bodies. That's how I kind of look at it. The, the two things are very, very closely linked. So yeah, definitely mental health and physical health are, are on par, I would say. What do you think, Sid, like coming from like a medical type of background? Um, how, how do you, th like if you see patients that are unwell, do you, do you see a correlation with their mental health? And, you know. You know, that's such, a, that's such an interesting question, actually, because... Hmm. Um, it, like the word you mentioned holistic is so yeah. key here the yeah. what is it about when you're you know when you're in a good phase with your health you might be on a health kick you're eating well yeah. you're doing your regular exercise that you're just overall looking after yourself exactly um, it's that buzz you get like it's that buzz of like you know what you feel good about the fact that you're taking care of yourself and it motivates you like the more you do it the more you're like actually I feel good about this and and what where yeah. is that feeling it's not in your body it's in your mind isn't it that feeling's yeah. in your mind it's growing in your mind but from what you're doing in your with your body yeah and I think it's just it's it's it can be quite hard to get started and motivated like the li the listener earlier said you know they realized they were putting on weight but then they they become more active and I, I really really look up to that because I think that's the hardest part is making that first step totally. you mentioned er earlier about you know think of a day where you've like pretty much been lazy all day and compare mm -hmm. it to a day where you've been active that mm -hmm. lazy day you've had you might have been distracting yourself all day like watching you know tv or movies and in that short time you're watching them you might have convinced yourself you were having a good time but you were yep. you were really 
just escaping from the realities of life. And at the end of the mm. day, when you go to bed, how do you feel? What have you achieved compared to, you know, you've you've done this X, Y and Z, had a jog as well. And then you said you sleep better. Yes, because you're you might be physically, you know, drained. But then you've got that element of comfort in knowing yeah. in yourself that you've had a good day. You haven't just thrown it away. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that's really, really key. Um, looking at it like holistically, um, it does all in, uh, link together, doesn't it? We've had a really yeah, good comment we, here, Sid. I don't know if you can yeah. see that. Um, I make sure to put an automatic reminder on my phone every 15 minutes to get up and move more when I'm on YouTube or other apps. Even some um, simple squats help. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. That's like a way to embed um, regular activity in your daily routine, isn't it? Yeah, I remember, thank I, you I, for I, that comment, Mukita Khan. I read somewhere or maybe I saw it somewhere where someone was like, you know, when you boil a kettle, as the kettle's boiling, you could just quickly do a few squats or do a few lunges. And I, I know it sounds a bit silly, but it's like it's a little part of our day that we actually you might you might boil a kettle three times a day. You know what I mean? And that's that's like what I, I don't know. 15 lunges more that you would have you didn't do yesterday and all the little exactly. things count if you decided to do that every time it would all it would accumulate to something so and, I think um, these little hints uh, and tips are really helpful guys so keep them coming yeah and in terms of exercise these excellent and but we've got to remember diet and exercise they go hand in hand we've got to be good with both in order to support that overall healthy lifestyle yeah. um I just wanted to highlight that obesity related illnesses are putting a significant burden on the NHS here and about a quarter of us adults are affected by obesity can you believe mm -hmm. that a quarter and that then puts us at risk of things like heart disease diabetes certain cancers and even yeah. depression dementia yeah. um you mentioned il earlier about I'll go on for Donna. No, sorry, I was just going to say, Sid, what you, the stats that you just said there reminded me of something that I told the kids at school. So I'm um, okay. co com conveniently right now, the recent topic that we did with Year 8 was um, um, it's about uh, being healthy and, the, and it starts off talking about diet and lifestyle. And one of the things that the kids were quite shocked at, and I was as well when we were talking about it, was, you know, one in five deaths globally can be somehow related to an individual's diet so whether that's you know ex mm. um you know an extreme case that's uh, come from their diet some form of deficiency that's led to a death or whatnot but somewhere in that in their medical history one in five deaths can be linked to diet and and i found that absolutely outstanding uh, outstanding like globally it's a world health organization stat that was and the kids were kind of fascinated by it and they and you know i think a lot of people separate um you know bad health to do with diet from countries like our own i think often people think it's a over there problem you know you think you know bad diet is something that's far, like bad diet that causes death or causes severe illness people might associate with that with you know lack of food poverty malnourishment all those things you know we have a tendency to make things black and white don't we and we kind of put that over there but really it's a worldwide issue that stat was globally and actually people die with to with things to do with our diets right here in our own country and one of the things that you've just mentioned there Sid is obesity of of course like it's it's a it's a little mini kind of pandemic epidemic of its own this obesity issue uh, and and it comes from two things um you know a lack of awareness of diet you know people are spiraling out of control in terms of the diet and then this Co uh, the compounded effect of um, a sedentary lifestyle and it, it which obviously exasperates dietary issues and, and now we've got this thing of like a quarter of adults are affected by obesity like how massive is that stat like I don't know if is anyone else listening to this and feeling blown away a quarter of adults are affected by obesity in the UK I'm, I'm actually quite scared because it yeah you, when we when we think of what we were saying at the beginning as our bodies being something that we've been entrusted with you know what are we doing if this is if this is how we you know use them it's yep. it is really hard I know it is really hard like because it's you know it's common it's it's everywhere it's like you say it's like another disease in itself but um mm. following from that um I'm aware from my profession that the most common reason for a child to be admitted to hospital for general anesthetic which is ha having to go to sleep for a medical treatment the most common reason is tooth decay dental decay this is another preventable disease as well um it can affect you know the child's eating sleeping it causes 
pain, infection, swelling. It can even restrict your breathing to the extent that people have died from dental infection from tooth decay. Wow, and did not know that yeah. at all. And how is this relevant? Well, the higher your sugar intake, the higher your risk of tooth decay. So okay. our diets are affecting us from all different angles here, whether it's obesity, whether it's tooth decay. And even these poor little children, almost mm. half of them have had tooth decay by the age of eight. And you start Gosh. getting your adult teeth at age six. So just think, you've by eight, you've already <laughs> your teeth are already rotting away and there's no replacing them. So diet and health is not just something that catches up with you over time in your adult life it can set mm. you up for life from, from very early on mm. gosh I didn't actually know all that inf- like as in that tooth decay was that bad at that young and um, that's that's quite interesting definitely um just on that note say just I think others others might be interested in this question but are there any foods that you would recommend that children should 100% avoid to minimize tooth decay Oh, that's a good question. Well, like we say, everything in moderation. We've been saying that throughout, haven't we? So I'm not going to ban anything from anyone 100 percent. But the the main offenders tend to be things like drinks, even, you know, there's fizzy drinks, but there's even like fruit juices and sugar free drinks as well. They're still acidic, so they can still, you know, harm and weaken your teeth. And then just in general, snacking between meals is a big one as well. It's right. much better to have your food within the meal rather than a snack here, a snack there, a snack here, a snack there. Because every time mm. you're eating, you have to treat that as like an attack, if you like, on your teeth. Okay. So the, the less attacks you have a, a day, the better. And okay. obviously, foods in high sugar, like your chocolates, your sweets, your biscuits and things mm. like that, the more of them you have, then the higher your risk of decay as well. Mm-hmm. I've never looked at snacking, like minimizing snacking from a, a dental perspective. So that's mm-hmm. really interesting, to be honest. A lot of people think about it from like health and weight loss, kind of um, bit managing calories and whatnot. But I've never thought yeah. about managing snacking from a dental perspective. So thank, thanks a lot for that, Sid, actually. I think that's it. It informed <laughs> me of a lot and hope that other people have benefited from that. Oh, thank you. Um, I think we've been getting more comments as well while, while we've been talking. Should we go back and have a look at some of them? Yeah, definitely. All right. I'm having to scroll. Jazakallah, everyone who's getting involved. We've had um, we've had a lot of, what's the word, a lot of input today. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we've, oh, I don't know where to start. Jazakallah, everyone. Really, really good comments here. So um, I've got one saying that I think it's really important when you're taking care of someone else's health to ask for help in maintaining your own health too. Thank you, Mariam. Oh, that's a that's a really good comment actually, because I think as sisters, as women, mm. you know, we are we are naturally going to be, you know, possibly taking care of others, whether it's your parents, your mm. kids, your siblings, and it starts from looking after yourself as well. And yeah. it's like that thing, you know, when you're on an airplane and they give you the instructions for if there's an emergency, and they always say mm-hmm. to put your own mask on before. The person you're looking after because how can you look after them if you're compromised yourself right yeah yeah it's like that thing is an, an empty vessel can't pour out to others um, oh I like that one I've not heard that before so yeah I'm sure that's like some quote I've read somewhere not not my genius at all <laughs> but yeah um, definitely you can't you can't burn out yourself and give to others sufficiently can you so I think that's a really good reminder taking care of someone else's health but also ask for help to take care of your own health 100% and then we had one from Amina Umara saying, Assalamu yeah. alaikum, pray you well. I mean, it would also be more motivating if locally sister could get a group together to go walking. It's a good opportunity to create sisterhood, social interaction and health. I think that's an excellent idea, Amina. That is such um, a good idea. Is this sister based in Newcastle? I'd like to know. Um, because you know what? These are the things we need. Like, you know, whenever I'm in... I, this is going to sound silly, but whenever I'm in a car and I see a group of runners go past, and I'm, ironically, I'm driving past them, but I always look at them thinking, <laughs> oh, I wish I was in that group. But then I think, you know oh. what? If, if there was a group of like Muslim sisters who uh, would go running regularly, I'd be in that group. So if, the, you oh. know, should we start one or should, you know, if, if people are interested in doing this, like, you know, why, why isn't it something we could start right here, right now? So, you know, people start commenting, start discussing it. I don't see why that can't be created. And you know what, I think that um, our, like, you know, the 
upper generations are actually quite good at this. I don't know if you see it, Fazano, when you're driving mm. around sometimes, but I sometimes see like aunties, you know, in groups walking together and yeah. it makes it makes my heart so happy. I just think good for yeah. them, like Allahumma Bark Lahum, that they're doing it, they're getting together. And yeah. uh, you know, once like, you know, restrictions and things started easing and when the weather was getting better last year, I saw a lot of it and yeah. I thought good good for them. They're having a chat, they're having a little catch up, but they're also doing that physical activity that they wouldn't be doing if they were sat at home. Yeah, hundred so percent. It's a social aspect as well. It, it does a lot for you doing exercise in groups. So I definitely think that is such a good idea. And if there's anyone who wants to start that kind of initiative, you should definitely should. Local sisters walking together, running together, or doing anything physical together, physical activity. It's a good idea. Mariam O has said, for me, at some point, feeding myself was a chore. So I'd say healthy to me is three meals a day or maybe just getting out of bed. So you know that's a good point that's what's healthy to you and we did ask that what is health to you so if, mm-hmm. if that's you know progress for you managing to feed yourself and getting that energy then you know good for you and I hope that you continue to progress and go in the right direction with that sister inshallah inshallah so Sorry. let's keep going is there any more comments you can see Sid or continue yeah we've got we've got a few so um I'm just trying to pick out the ones that are related to our discussion here because there's a lot going on. We had a comment from Tabby Manira saying, good health doesn't just affect you. It affects those around you and the dynamics. As a family, mm. my my brother shifted us to a healthier lifestyle and, and alhamdulillah, we are a lot happier. Oh, amazing. Amazing. That is so nice. Like the fact that doing it together as a family. 100%. Good for your, good for you and your family and your brother. May Allah reward him abundantly for getting everybody on board. I think that's that can be quite a chore. Um, yeah. That could be quite a task, can't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's excellent. Um, so we had um another comment saying from the same commenter, Tabby Manira, saying, "If I see him in the kitchen, I have to go for an apple instead of chocolate." <laughs> <laughs> oh that's nice that well I mean is it nice <laughs> no I'm joking it's, it's definitely <laughs> nice yeah you've got you've got that motivation haven't you you've got some motivation keeping you guys, yeah keeping you guys all in check um but yeah that's that's nice they're doing it all together as a family 100% yeah, I think that's really good. Be it like, having that social element, whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, it can be yeah. such a such a big source of like you know motivation and drive for people. Yeah, so don't, and I think don't be alone. That that reminds me of something that's quite important to point out about you know as parents setting example of like healthy lifestyle, healthy living, um, and like bringing up children with that as a norm I think because I feel like now um, you know a lot of us might be in a situation where we're quite we're quite used to certain habits and certain ways of diets that aren't really that you know healthy or maybe aren't don't um, make time for physical well-being but you know as the next generation as younger people maybe we have the opportunity with you know our children and um, our families to do that differently and do it from the get-go and to build in those good habits so I think that's something to be mindful of. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for, to everyone who's been interacting with us today. I think it's time to summarise now. Do you, th- do you think, Fazana? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so just to summarise of what we've been talking about today. So we've talked about how um, our physical well-being is super important and two of the ways in which we can be improve our physical well-being is being mindful of our diets and our... Um, uh, fitness levels so combating a sedentary lifestyle and combating a uh, diets that are uh, overindulging and um, not mindful of the environment um, and one of the main things that we want to emphasize and leave people with is the idea of balance and moderation if there are improvements and changes that you want to make uh, make those changes with that with those principles in mind if we have to do things with balance we have to do things with moderation and you know all changes don't happen overnight. So pick small things, and but things that you can do consistently to have an overall better impact on your well-being through your fitness and your diet. Um, is there anything you want to add, Sid? Um, I would just like to say, just generally, just by staying healthy and active throughout life, that we can be a benefit to ourselves, our families, our friends around us, Mm-hmm. the families that we as sisters could be raising one day and then overall you know inshallah benefiting our communities too 
many of us are from ethnic minorities. We're in higher risk groups. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we need we need to get really get on on it and, you know, work, work hard and push ourselves. And any change that's going to be made overall has to start with ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you to everybody for listening and discussing health with us today on Sisters Striving. Fazana and I will be back next week, inshallah, on Monday at 5 p.m. again. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>